All right, so it is uh, five o'clock, so I will begin uh, reading our remote script uh, and hope that everybody kind of continues to join. So as a preliminary matter, this is Ashley Erisman, Chair of the Nantucket Conservation Commission. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mark Beal. Here. Seth Engelborg. Here. Uh, Erisman here. Ian Golding. Here. Dave LaFleur. Present. Joe Topham. Here. And we will be without uh, Maureen tonight. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Jeff Carlson. Present. Joanne Dodd. Here. Yeah. Right. Uh, anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. We have Arthur Reed. Here. Uh, we have Brian Madden. Here. Of Steve Reichert. Here. All right. Uh, Rob McNeil. Here. Uh, Art Gasparo. Here. Don Bracken. Here. And I think Gene Crouch. I'm not sure that I've got you. Here. <clears throat> Here. All right. I think I've gotten everybody who's on so far and I'll announce um, other speakers as they come. Uh, so good evening. This open meeting of the Nantucket Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring, ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Uh, for this meeting, the Nantucket Conservation Commission is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Uh, if members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Uh, and for items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. Staff will activate the chat feature on YouTube. Members of the public that have comments or questions can use this feature to communicate with the public body. Instructions are on the town's website. The chair and or staff will do their best to address questions and or comments. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Uh, so with that, uh, we will open tonight's meeting under public comment. Um, not sure if we have public comment yet. It does not look like we have any public comment uh, at this point. 
Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, go through tonight's continuances. Uh, so under notices of intent, we have Nantucket Islands Land Bank, all land bank properties, which is continued until June 24th. Uh, we have Lower Pacamo Nominee Trust at 88 Pacamo Road, continued until July 8th. Uh, Pacamo Point Realty Trust at 90 Pacamo Road, continued until July 8th. And I believe that is it for continuances. Uh, so we will begin tonight uh, with the town of Nantucket DPW townwide. Uh, this is represented by Rob McNeil and Jean Crouch uh, and Commissioner LaFleur is recused for this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe uh, Jean has a short presentation just to recap on uh, the, uh, the general notice of intent. Not, uh, the, the one that's up on the screen is actually Surfside and that's uh, item two. So we're gonna stick with the first one, please. Thank you. And uh, Jean's got a little update from uh, Natural Heritage. Yeah, as, as we met at the last meeting, we had just received the letter from Natural Heritage uh, the determination of natural heritage is that it would not be a take um, for the project given the, uh, <clears throat> the conditions of um, what we worked out with natural heritage in terms of coordinating with them and for certain activities or other activities that were in fact fully exempt or um, uh, did not require any uh, additional coordination with uh, the department. Um, so I, at the time we had just gotten the letter. Um, I think that the members hadn't even had a chance to see the letter. So uh, we continued for your opportunity to, to review it um, for tonight. And I'm certainly available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Uh, no one has typed anything yet, but I'm also a little slow on the typing myself. Okay. Um, do we have everything we'd need to close at this point? Yes, you would. Okay. Dean and Rob, I'm assuming you would like to close tonight. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I think you're probably pretty good. There's only nine people watching, actually. And I, I okay. Um, we're a couple of them. Yeah, that's what I figured. This one's been on for a while, so I think the comments have probably come out already. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, does a commissioner, uh, would a commissioner like to make the motion uh, to close? So moved. Uh, motion made by Seth. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe, also by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that uh, carries with Commissioner LaFleur recused. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Really. Um, all right, so that moves us on to another town of Nantucket DPW. Uh, this one is at Surfside Beach. Uh, represented by Stephen Reichert and Rob McNeil, uh, and Commissioner LaFleur is also recused on this one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, following uh, previous commission meetings, uh, the uh, department and its uh, consultant have addressed uh, comments and would like to make that presentation tonight. Uh, Steve, if you are ready to go. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Joanne, for bringing the plan back up. Sure. Um, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Madam Chair and Commission members. Um, we met with you guys two meetings ago, and um, we had not provided a waiver request letter as part of our submission package at that point. Um, we've included that with the current submission. We also have revised the plans for the Surfside Beach project where we have relocated the um, drainage improvements away from the um, coastal bank area and outside the 100 foot buffer zone for the, um, the coastal bank area there. 
Uh, we have not revised the location or the um, design for the uh, deck behind the building. The other improvement that we have made to the project is we've added rope and post um, access, um, roast and pope, roast, post and rope uh, access uh, restrictions along the access path down to the beach. It's about 750 feet of uh, posts and ropes there. Um, also included in the uh, waiver with our current submission package was a letter of support from the Commission on Disabilities from Nantucket as well. Um, I don't know, Rob, if you have anything to add. Uh, no, sir, thank you. So I guess with that, we'll you know answer any questions any of you members may have. Hey, um, thank you. I really appreciate you guys um, moving the uh, compensatory storage for the uh, water holding um, out of the resource area. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also appreciate moving the water storage. Unfortunately, I don't think that the deck as proposed uh, is still going to be able to meet our performance standards. I understand that the waiver request was submitted, but I don't think the applicant has met the burden of proof to uh, ex explain why that deck is needed. They talk about using the deck as a way to delineate or demarcate um, access and prevent visitors from accessing the beach through the dunes on the south side of that structure. And then in the same letter, they talk about how on the existing path, they're going to achieve that demarcation through post and rope railways. So why can't the same post and rope be used at the edge of the parking lot where the deck is proposed to prevent access? I certainly appreciate wanting to open uh, an ADA accessible deck, but it's something I feel strongly about, but it's not really in our purview. Our purview is protecting the wetland resource and we have to analyze the net benefit to the resource itself, not to the public's enjoyment of the resource. I think that's a crucial distinction here. Thank you, Seth. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, Joe and then Mark. I agree with everything Seth just said. So, and it goes back to what I said last meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Mark. Well, I was agreeing with with, uh, with with Seth also. And I'd be curious to hear the applicants uh, just uh, reasons for the wa waiver request. It, it wasn't clear in my book. Thank you, Mark. Um, can you guys maybe explain um, why you chose that this particular waiver? The waiver request is required because we're do uh, the proposed deck is within the 50 foot buffer and within the 100 foot buffer. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say I uh, agree with my fellow commissioners. I'm still very uncomfortable with the deck. Um, I'd rather see, because I think you mentioned last time that this site might be going under a, a real redesign in the next 10 years to actually have it redesigned to have deck, you know, that's completely out of, of the 50 for us. Um, and I know that might not be feasible uh, for this project, but I think for the resource area, doing it one time out of um, the buffer zone is, is important for us. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Uh, currently you do not. Okay. So I can add uh, to that, Madam Chair. Okay, yep, go ahead, Rob. Uh, while it is true that uh, the, the town is uh, Moving forward with a concession master plan effort, uh, the likelihood that either the footprint of the building 
or the facility itself will markedly change uh, down the road is pretty unlikely. Uh, the, the fact that this site is where it's at, um, as close to the beach as it is with the, um, the sea level rise and the um, expected continued coastal erosion uh, that's expected to continue. Uh, the, uh, also the stated use of the facility and the, the limits that um, select board uh, ultimately have expressed uh, to um, the, the current intensity of the use at this site um, would lead me to believe that um, the, the facility itself will largely stay where it's at and uh, to the size that it's at. Uh, what we're proposing is sort of just incremental improvements to the site that uh, we've done uh, prior to this in the parking lot, addressing circulation and some of the other issues we've addressed at similar or other facilities on the island uh, to better and safely serve the people that are currently using the site as it's been constructed. Um, this project uh, seeks to, uh, yes, it, it is there for humans uh, and not the resource specifically, uh, but what we're trying to do is address issues that we have uh, encountered and trying to symbiotically design all of them uh, to work within the parameters of uh, not just uh, the Wetlands Protection Act, but also uh, with, the, uh, the, with the local concerns uh, above and beyond that. And so what that means is we have parking lot flooding uh, based on the uh, undersized infiltrating catch basin. Uh, so the first iteration was to offer an overflow uh, that provided additional infiltration capacity uh, to uh, alleviate that uh, on far more frequent and storm events that uh, we see um, that are more intense than they have been in the past due to climate change. And so again, we, we took a stab at it, located it where we thought it was appropriate, and then uh, took the comments from the commission and um, uh, were able to modify that design uh, to relocate it uh, to a, um, a more acceptable location. Um, further, uh, the, the deck itself um, was in response to Improvements to uh, handicap accessibility. Uh, currently, the, the parking lot is, is has service for, I believe, seven uh, handicap parking spaces uh, to the to the east uh, of the concession. And right now, uh, any any persons that uh, park there uh, uh, utilize a a striped or a marked path uh, that was added in our first parking lot uh, schematic change uh, to get them safely over to access. Uh, so the accessible route from the parking takes them uh, along the front of the building to the north side and uh, to the handicap accessible ramp. And so that coupled with uh, um, better access both to the concession and the bathrooms uh, and frankly, the, um, uh, the, the beach showers uh, the exterior, on the rear of the building uh, were all coupled together. And uh, we worked with our architect uh, to uh, best design the space to be able to provide direct uh, handicap access uh, from the parking area uh, around the rear of the building, as we show. Um, we had consulted with um, Jeff Carlson uh, Vince Murphy and others, uh, when we uh, were looking at uh, what was appropriate for the embankment off the rear of the building. Uh, certainly the building and the existing deck 
I believe, already encroach into your 50-foot uh, buffer. Uh, certainly, we uh, respectfully did not know uh, that a waiver was required or certainly would have been included in the original package. And we appreciate the commission for raising that concern. And we've certainly uh, taken steps to apply for that waiver under these circumstances. Um, considering it's a municipal project, uh, I think that the benefit is uh, not for a specific uh, individual. This is uh, for the benefit of the public and uh, the continued public use. And, uh, and frankly, the public respect for the resource. Uh, the effort here was not solely focused on uh, human interests, but frankly was to uh, protect the resource from further erosion and damage. Uh, at our first meeting, uh, you, Madam Chair, mentioned uh, your interest in exploring uh, access restrictions along the main beach access. Uh, witnessing people going through the dunes uh, unnecessarily and causing harm to the resource. Uh, I've worked with uh, uh, Sheila Lucy, the Harbor Master uh, in the Marine Department uh, to work up an, a cost estimate and a reality check on 750 feet uh, to the tune of about $5,000 um, uh, to invest in providing that level of protection uh, that you and the commission asked for. Um, and it would, uh, as Commissioner Engelbord has uh, asked for and hoped for, I would tie into the base of the stairs uh, for that deck uh, to basically seal off, um, you know, obvious access uh, to the rear of the building. Uh, the, the idea of the footprint, if you've looked at the details of the architectural uh, design, was to ensure that the uh, the sauna tubes uh, supporting the deck uh, were no further than what were currently out there and that the, uh, the, the, the deck itself cantilevers over um, to basically uh, not touch the ground, but to basically uh, hover over uh, the slope that then goes down uh, into the dunes. And ultimately the idea was to, uh, to, to seal off that um, and discourage people from going uh, that route. Once again, uh, the, uh, the, the secondary benefit uh, for a lot of folks that uh, uh, have ambulatory issues, uh, as have been highlighted in the support letter from the Commission on Disabilities, uh, was that um, the folks can, could uh, come up and enjoy uh, the beach scenery uh, from the rear deck and not, uh, not feel excluded. Uh, from being able to visit. Uh, if you visited our other locations, uh, other concessions, uh, we have uh, taken great pride in uh, having grant funded pro projects and programs uh, that uh, provide beach access uh, to many of our ambulatory um, uh, issued constituents and visitors to the island uh, through a series of um, uh, grants from the uh, Massachusetts uh, Architectural Access Board. And that includes boardwalks uh, on Jefferson Ave that are installed annually, improved from the Moby mats that were there before. Uh, we've done the same thing out at Jetty's Beach uh, to a, a, a visiting platform. And that those installs are coordinated through the, uh, the state trained uh, local bird watcher uh, through natural resources and uh, installed by DPW annually. Uh, here, that kind of thing, uh, we have not explored currently, uh, boardwalk out to the beach. Uh, South shore is a little bit more challenging with the wave action and such and uh, the, the fluctuating tide. However, uh, I think a, a reasonable compromise is to provide uh, a, a, at least a visual improvement and having people be able to visit the beach uh, from that location. Uh, the, we also offer a, um, a program that a lot of people don't know. Uh, DPW offers a beach wheelchair program, uh, which is absolutely free. Uh, we supply beach wheelchairs to uh, folks that uh, uh, 
can get ultimately wheeled to the beach uh, by family members. And uh, that's been a, a hugely successful and rewarding program. So this is really just yet again, a uh, municipal effort uh, supported by uh, the Commission on Disabilities and uh, similar to efforts that we've done at other facilities. And uh, we, we really look to, um, to you as the commission to understand or ask questions to, to better understand what the motives are and uh, how we are contributing to um, uh, protecting the resource at the same time that we're trying to improve the facilities uh, for access to all. Thank you, Rob. I, I appreciate your explanation. And I think, you know, we all understand um, the ADA compliance and the need for that. I, I just think there's probably a better compromise with this building to stay out of the resource area. Um, and I think that a few commissioners and myself included would like to maybe see an alternative design or why an alternative design wouldn't work at this site. Um, I know that's something I would, I would like to look more into. Um, but I, I, again, we appreciate the, the need for ADA compliance. There's just so much frontage of that parking lot. Um, I would think you could get decking outside of the 50 for us. Um, but that's uh, just where I stand. So I don't know sure. if any other commissioners kind of feel the same. Is it possible to pull up the plan again, Madam Chair? Um, it might be worth at least exploring uh, where that buffer zone line exists uh, to just be able to highlight that for folks. Yep, thank you, Joanne. So that if you can see uh, the, the 50 foot line that's being highlighted, it actually runs right through the middle of the building. Uh, so it encompasses the entirety of uh, the rear deck uh, and the rear half of the building you know, under existing conditions. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what we're starting from. I think, uh, frankly, in, in the projects that I've uh, worked on before you know this is a this is a uh, a reasonable uh, a reasonable plan in my my uh, estimation I i'm happy to take more specific uh, comments if uh if there's something that would make sense uh whether it's uh shaving part of the cantilever uh but to be honest i think the the distance uh, was measured in the field uh, with input from natural resources. And uh, I, I feel like this is uh, a project that makes a lot of sense for the reasons we discussed. Um, again, I'm, I'm open to discussing uh, what the commission may feel like. And, and frankly, I keep saying that, frankly, but um, I think the uh, idea that the commission feels strongly about keeping the facility outside of the 50 uh, would certainly be something that would uh, be considered in the reimagining of uh, the concession uh, reconstruction of that facility uh, during our master planning effort. Uh, I, I, I truly believe that as we as we look at this whole uh, facility again, uh, having those kind of uh, opinions into the record for a future uh, decision on what that facility is going to be, look like in uh, next uh, would go a long way uh, to getting us both uh, across the finish line to, to permit the next project uh, when that does come. And uh, we all know, you know, even if we all wanted it today, uh, this is probably a, a five to 10 year out um, reality. Thank you, Rob, I uh, appreciate that. Um, I, I think from a resource area perspective, 
rather than disturbing the resource area now and then doing a redesign in five years that's going to disturb the resource area again, from our perspective, it would be better to just do it one time, you know, with the, the ultimate plan in place. And I realized the town kind of wants this placeholder in there. Uh, but I think as far as our resource areas are concerned, that's maybe not the best way to go about it. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately the deck is considered structural um, and we don't allow new structure within the 50s. So that is a big hang up for us. And even though it's a, a municipal project, you know, it's still very clearly written in our regs that we wouldn't allow that sort of structure. Um, so it's, it, it is difficult to justify. So, um, Mark. Well, thank you for your thoughts on that one, actually. That helps me too. Um, I wonder if there be a, a, a solution. I'm very much in favor of the storm water management plan and appreciate they, they're moving the uh, filtration system. Um, is there a way to um, move that process along so we can get that going uh, and have the deck come back at a later time with a different possible, possible design or or something, but I, I don't want to kill this and lose the stormwater drainage plan. Thank you, Mark. That's a, a great question because I think um, commissioners are happy with certain aspects of the plan, but hung up on the on the deck. So that's a good question for Rob. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't. Um, I don't know what the time frame will be uh, regarding uh, investing dollars into this site. Um, I could say that uh, the earliest this uh, plan, if approved, would move forward would be fall uh, to be able to get everything constructed. Um, it's it, at the very earliest. Uh, right now, cost of construction is, as you know, uh, wildly uh, out of control. And so uh, I think that the, the most important thing for us was to uh, secure the design and, and get permits in hand so that uh, if and when we have uh, funding and or contractors lined up, uh, we can take action and get it done. Thank you, Rob. Um, it is possible though, I guess it would still be up to you, but I think we could issue um, on certain aspects of this permit if we closed and not issue on others. Again, that's further down the road, but um, Rob, you and the DPW would have to be amenable to that uh, possibility. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public at this point? Uh, our minutes taker had a comment, but her question was answered, so. Okay. All right. Um, Madam there... Chair, if I, if I would, I, I'm curious, um, if there, what are the specific burdens uh, that need to be explained or proven uh, to have the waiver considered? Um, I, I heard that uh, it's not allowed. And I also heard that, uh, that it was a, a waiver was required, uh, but I haven't heard specifically what burdens uh, you're looking for uh, to be proven. Yep, so you have to justify that waiver. It looks like Seth has his hand up. You can take it, but um, in my reading of the waiver requirement, you have to justify a long-term net benefit to the resource area itself and, and provide that any adverse impacts are minimized um, so you have to clearly, the burden of proof is on the applicant to clearly say how in the future this is going to provide a long-term net benefit to the resource itself and why something else couldn't achieve the same net benefit. So like we discussed putting the deck somewhere else, putting a different demarcating barrier to prevent access to that resource area. And I think the question about 
accessible view sheds is important, but I think also you would have to justify how that view shed is any different than one that could be achieved outside of the 50 foot buffer in the parking lot or on the north side of the building. So I think there's some specific things we need to see to understand what the, the long-term net benefit to that coastal dune is. So if I may, uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I would agree that um, we do need to see it. Uh, I wouldn't, anyone who hasn't uh, visited the site uh, with, the, with the current application in hand, I would invite you to, uh, to do so. I mean, to me, uh, earlier there was a comment about, well, why couldn't we just um, you know, block off the access up to the existing set of stairs? Um, and so to me, that was explored. And uh, the, the conclusion that was drawn was uh, the folks that are currently using the rear of the building as uh, pedestrian access, which is eroding your coastal resource, um, would step over uh, a rope and continue to do so. Uh, the idea behind the cantilever deck uh, was to basically extend the cantilever uh, to a point where the slope of the coastal dune uh, would basically um, uh, dissuade uh, because it's already uh, uh, vegetated and stable, uh, would dissuade uh, anyone from being able to navigate that. It's a, it's a steeper, uh, very uh, more difficult location to navigate. And uh, I think the idea was to prevent further erosion, be able to uh, restore what uh, has currently been disturbed and uh, to, to, to keep it long-term from having further impacts. Uh, last time uh, you asked about the well. Um, so this is a unique location. Uh, the, the public well uh, which qualifies as a public well because of the number of people that it serves, but it's not tied in with a public well, or, or sorry, a public water source. Uh, this is a, it's a deep water well uh, that's uh, uh, drilled behind the building. So it's under the existing deck. Um, you know, further erosion to that, you know, jeopardizes the, the well itself. You know, but I, I think the resource uh, is, in my opinion, and this is how we've presented it in our waiver request, the resource is better served having the deck in place as a block uh, to further um, uh, wayward pedestrians uh, in concert with uh, the requested uh, access uh, post and rope um, that we've uh, seen marine uh, install at a number of other uh, municipal facilities. Thank you, Rob. Um, any other thoughts or comments from commissioners? Joe? I just see the deck size, um, and I get what Rob is saying, but I see that deck as more as a viewing deck than a deck that's just providing accessibility. I feel like it's oversized if, if they were gonna come in and that's the reason is for accessibility. It's really big. It looks like you could have, you know, tables and chairs and viewing, you know, it just seems like it's a lot more that could go on that deck. I, I think it could be minimized. I think that they could, you know, come back with helical piers. I, I just think there's a redesign that could be coming forward. Um, but also if the new design came forward today, we wouldn't permit this, uh, porch or the building within this area. So it, it would all get pushed back off the bluff. So that's something we're just trying to let you know, Rob, is that's what's going to happen uh, coming forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I worry, especially with these town buildings, like we have really old buildings that weren't placed and designed well. And now we have so many more people who visit the island and Kind of again, instead of looking at that five and 10 year plan to just do it all correctly, then we're kind of patching it together now. And I, I just worry that that will impact the resource area. 
And again, similar to what Joe said, when I look at the plan, the mass of that deck looks almost equal to the actual building size. I mean, it does look pretty huge compared to what's there. Um, so I think sure. it could be re-looked at. Um, Jeff had his hand up and then Rob. Yeah, I just want to throw in, I know Rob mentioned that that Vince and I have both met with him out on the site and, and something that hasn't been said in the hearing to this point. And I just wanted to make everyone aware of a, kind of a conversation that we had out in the field when we were looking at it. And um, I think we've talked about a lot of times when I meet with advocates out in the field, we kind of brainstorm through projects and try to come up with solutions and something that, you know, we feel has the the best chance of, of, of being reviewed favorably, even if it's, you know, a, a waiver project or whoever it is. And I know one option that we discussed uh, is one that we've, we've also talked for, you know, kind of looking at what the regulations was looking at, you know, some sort of more, you know, pervious style installation and in something like, uh, you know, a bluestone or, you know, brick area or something that by the regulations currently doesn't get defined as structure. And, by my own defense, I kind of steered away from that because I had some concerns about about runoff and also kind of the impact of having to, you know, set that in the top of the slope. But that was something that um, I kind of steered them away from, um, even though it, it, it met the performance standard because of those those other concerns. But I do know something that that was something that looking at a different service type that was non, you know, non-structural by the definitions, even though we, we've wanted to talk about that was discussed and, and kind of came up. Um, and, and I kind of pushed them away from that because I, I, I felt like the impacts of the install plus the concerns for water were were greater at the time. So rightfully or wrongfully, that's what I did. But uh, I just wanted to at least say that that was at least, you know, kind of contemplated as an option here. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Rob, you had had your hand up and then Ian, I just saw you. Sure. Uh, I will see to Ian and then try to comment uh, on what I've heard. Okay, thank you. Ian, uh, go for it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So through you to Jeff, um, I'm, I'm glad that you steered them away from that because I think that would have a much greater impact. Um, I, I share my fellow commissioner's concern. I, I would like to see it less than it's currently drawn at 12 feet wide. So I, I would be prepared to approve under the circumstances, give a waiver to a deck that wasn't as wide rather than countenance as we haven't, have yet to change our regulations rather than countenance a brick patio there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair, if I may. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, and uh, see, patience pays off. Uh, thank you, Ian, for those comments. Um, I think, uh, and Joe, certainly, um, I think getting to, getting to yes uh, certainly takes uh, a fair amount of back and forth. I, I truly believe that the, the net benefits to this project um, and, and certainly the long-term input uh, into the uh, facility replacement um, feasibility study will go a really long way. Uh, to that end, um, stormwater combined with the stormwater improvements, as well as, um, you know, uh, just tightening up and respecting what we have uh, at that site, uh, to me is going to uh, really improve the long-term viability of this location uh, and uh, the nearby resources. I am, uh, happy to uh, go back to the architect now uh, with these uh, fresh comments and to uh, work together with them uh, to revise the plan. Um, when, when we did, just to inform the commission on uh, where the design came from, um, uh, the idea was that essentially there's sort of a three-way um, corridor along the back of the building. And what that entailed was um, essentially, if you, you could kind of picture what's happening along the back of the deck, you would have a bench against the building, uh, showers that are existing on the uh, west side. So a bench on the east side, uh, the showers on the west side, 
you would have likely people standing uh, against the railing, uh, looking out and, or toweling off or just being up in that general area. And then uh, a movement corridor uh, between, the, between the two. So the idea was if we gave uh, three foot uh, to each of those, um, that would be beneficial. There were some ideas of maybe uh, uh, additional benches that would go along the railing. Um, but I think getting to a, a real number and coming back with a firm uh, plan would make a lot of sense. If, if we could, um, if we could, if I could get some input on a nine foot deck from the 12, uh, which would allow us to bring the sauna tubes in even closer to the building than are currently proposed. Um, I think that would be, I mean, to me, that would be a, uh, a reasonable compromise here. But again, uh, I'm, I'm hearing uh, lots of different things and I just wanted to get some input before we go uh, spend more uh, taxpayer dollars on redesign. Thank you, Rob. I think certainly if the size of the deck was decreased, I think it would be more palatable to commissioners. Um, you still have the same burden to meet with the waiver um, as far as, you know, explaining why this can't go elsewhere and the long-term net benefits. Um, but I think certainly reducing the size would um, probably help us. I don't know if any other commissioners have uh, thoughts on that one. Uh, Seth? Sorry if this was already talked about last meeting, but I'm just zooming in on the plan and looking closely. So the deck is currently proposed as an L shape on the eastern side and the southern side. Is there, a feasible, is there a feasible way to have that deck extend solely to the east of the existing structure um, to give the same size that you were looking at uh, to, to minimize the intrusion into the 50 foot buffer? Rob, is that something your architects could look into? Um, uh, so, I, I need to actually see what Seth is uh, referring to. The east side of the building is where there's currently a grass picnic table area adjacent to the handicap accessible parking. Um, without a wraparound deck, uh, they, the handicap are forced to go uh, through the parking lot to get to the concessions, uh, the handicap ramp and to the bathrooms and shower. Thank you, that answers the question. Um, the, knowing the site, the concession is on the west side, not the east side, so Correct. does that make sense? I mean, I, I, I know that parking lot, I live in Surfside. It, it's unfortunate, I guess, that all the handicapped spots were put in such a way that they were like the furthest away from the actual entrance and concession was there no way to have the handicapped parking spots be like right in front of that building? So on the north side of the building? Yeah, so it's actually the closest uh, location uh, to the building that is possible uh, under the current design. Uh, this is, we have a, we're, we're balancing uh, a circulation route for uh, the, the parking lot itself, which it also includes a NERDA bus stop. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of activity. Uh, the accessible route is required by law to be the, uh, where possible to be the closest uh, access point to the actual entrance to the facility. And so uh, what we did was we, uh, we, we updated that so there's no crossing. Uh, people parking at the handicap uh, location don't have to cross a vehicular route, even though they share you know, they, they, they have their own painted lane, but it, it is certainly less than ideal, uh, but it was new. It was something that we introduced and narrowed the vehicular lane uh, that was there previously. 
So it's a, it's safer, but it's certainly this is this is part of a uh, certainly a, a safer a, a more safe route uh, to get them to the other side of the building. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Sure. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, it would definitely be helpful to explore any other deck designs your architect thinks are feasible uh, that keeps the deck further out of the resource area. Um, it sounds like they, they can't go maybe on the east side, um, but I know we've had other architects sharpen their pencils and they have you know come up with plans that uh, they didn't think they'd be able to initially. Um, so, I mean, I really, I, I think there is possibility here. Um, to kind of redesign that deck to be out of the resource area a little bit better. Um, but I think the architect is really gonna have to um, do some hard thinking ab about how that would reconfigure. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also, you know, it's, I recognize what I say is gonna cause additional financial burden on the town, but I think it deserves a look to see if um, reconfiguring or moving some of the existing facilities that are of need to a different spot is beneficial. So you referenced uh, wanting to have the wraparound deck to hook into the existing showers I certainly understand the sentiment of wanting to do that, but from a feasibility standpoint of being able to meet the the Wetlands Protection Act here, could it, could it be looked at to actually move those showers to a different place on the site? Could it be looked at to reconfigure the deck to have all the amenities you need without having to wrap around uh, to the backside? And I... I'll leave that up to your architects to look at, but I think being open-minded and examining all the possibilities before you come in for the next hearing, going through all the alternatives will really let us know what's possible and, and what's not feasible. Thank you, Seth. Um, Rob, do you think that's a, a possibility for you to do with your architects? Uh, to be to be honest, uh, I would say it would really, I, I'm not sure how frequently the commission actually makes uh, site visits. Uh, I would really, um, uh, really love to have a site visit with the commission. I think it would be very beneficial uh, both to uh, anyone who hasn't been there and uh, to understand a little bit about the operation, where things are located and what the restrictions are. Uh, to also take a look at the resource, its current um, state, and uh, how uh, we believe that the uh, proposal uh, will uh, certainly benefit uh, long-term protection of, of the resource. Thank you, Rob. So we, we do site visits regularly before COVID, and as um, I think most all commissions, the site visits have kind of stopped. Um, you know, I think the Surfside Beach parking lot is an area that I'm assuming most commissioners have, have been to, uh, but you can certainly request a site visit there. Um, I, I still think we'd request the same sort of um, architectural redesign um, because I have to say, when I look at some of these sites that are town managed, they have been mismanaged for so long, which is what has led to some of these problems. So I think it's kind of twofold here, um, but I worry that you know, the walking around happened and happened and happened and the resource area was maybe getting degraded and nobody from the town end said, hey, we need to do something about this, you know? Um, so I think there needs to be an, an upped level of management from the town at all town owned sites um, because, you know, the town has not done a great job um, about managing their sites well for us. Um, and I think that's, that's an issue. Um, but I'm sure that we could get a site visit scheduled, um, maybe through Jeff and Joe, um, to, to go meet out there, uh, if that's something that you're requesting. 
I am requesting it. And I would say with all due respect, Madam Chair, uh, this manager uh, is paying attention and is taking, um, taking things seriously, which is why this application is before you. Um, so Jeff, uh, do you know when we could add that to the schedule? Yeah, I, I think we can just do it at our, our normal times that we were doing it before and we can do it, you know, the Monday before the next meeting. It'll certainly be available to do. We'll send out the time to everyone and we can just all meet there. And it should be pretty, pretty straightforward. All right. I think everyone knows how to get there. So it should be pretty good. Yes. All right. So are there any final comments or questions from commissioners? Like, no. So Rob, would you like to continue for two weeks? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this will continue for two weeks, uh, which I believe puts us at June 10th. Um, and we will have a site visit schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to Sweet Meadow Sylvia Lane LLC at 74 Westchester Street. And this is represented by Paul Santos. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the property owner, Sweet Meadow LLC, uh, this is a continuation of a notice of intent application for a property located at 74 Westchester Street. Um, and to refresh your memory, we came before you and successfully received a certificate of compliance for this site in which um, there was some long-term um, invasive species removal. There was a um, revegetation um, of the uh, buffer zone and the no disturb areas on the property um, on a piece of property that had been um, developed over some time. Um, you heard the application briefly to go through. This involved um, some relocation of some existing stone patios, um, the removal of a berm, the relocation of an underground uh, propane tank, uh, changing of a gravel driveway surface to shell, um, and the uh, replanting of some, um, some trees along the westerly property line. There were two issues uh, that commissioners had concerns with, um, specifically along the westerly property line, we were looking to eliminate a row of um, fairly substantial, what were at the time um, labeled cedars. We've since identified those as Leland cypress trees, uh, but the applicant has basically um, removed the request to remove those trees. And if I can just read from the supplement that was submitted for this specific hearing, it says to address the concerns from uh, commissioners at the May 6th meeting, the applicant proposes to remove the rows of Sharon hedge located on the easterly side of the existing driveway with no replacement and keep the existing Leland cypress trees along the westerly side of the existing driveway. The applicant had previously requested that the five trees, that five trees be removed over concerns of the trees falling in the event of a storm. The applicant now requests that the trees simply be trimmed back to prevent such a hazard. Um, the issue with the Rosa Sharon was we were, we were looking to replace Rosa Sharon with privet. Um, and in turn, now we're just looking to remove the Rosa Sharon um, completely um, from the easterly portion of the driveway. Um, so that's the application before you. Um, the issue specifically, I think the, the main issue was, was the issue of the, um, the removal of the, of the stand of Cypress, Leland Cypress trees along the westerly boundary and we've removed that component from the application. So happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any questions or comments from the public on this one? Do we have everything we'd need to close? Yes, you do. Okay, Paul, would you like to close? Yes, please. All right, is there a motion to close? Also move. Motion made by Mark, seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye, and thank you to Paul for identifying those trees as Cypress, not Cedar. Yes. Oh, well. That goes to Chloe. You know my identification skills. <laughs> <laughs>
Airsman I, Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Popham. Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all. Uh, and that moves us on to MLR3 LLC at 45 Shakamo Road right of way. Uh, and this is represented by Brian Madden, Don Bracken and Arthur Reed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden, uh, representing the applicant. Uh, I think this may be our, our fourth uh, hearing on the matter. And uh, at the last meeting, there were some questions uh, that came up that were directed uh, towards staff. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to them to uh, provide that update. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jeff, do you wanna go ahead and update us? Sure, I'll, I'll try my best to, to be as concise as possible. Uh, but the questions that had been asked to us and what we were looking to get from town council uh, was kind of the differentiation between a public, semi-public and private way. And then obviously, you know, kind of what constitutes control and control by, by the applicant. So um, I put that question out and kind of put it into our refer for legal services. Uh, from there, I was directed as I kind of have warned everyone and suspected that I was directed over to uh, our planning director, Andrew Force who's kind of our local expert on public ways and private ways and, and, and land use, obviously. And we had a pretty extensive discussion about it. So um, I'll try to run through this quickly. Um, if people have questions, I'm happy to try my best to answer. Uh, but essentially kind of our discussion about this project in specific was whether or not this road would constitute a, a semi-public way. Um, obviously public ways are ways that are, you know, taken by the town and essentially owned by the town and maintained by the town. Um, so any of the, the town owned or taken roads uh, all over the island, there's, there's, there's lists of them. Those are public ways. There's no restriction to access or use uh, to anyone outside of, you know, traditional traffic markers, things like, you know, lane markers, obviously roadway signs. So, um, but they're available for use. Semi-public ways uh, from our discussion are ways that are not necessarily owned by the town. They're owned by you know, either abutters or people that own fee interest in the road or have rights within the road, but don't restrict access to others for use. There's no, you know, gates or signage or deterrent from people to be there. And it's available for uh, people to pass and repass over. It's available for, um, you know, delivery trucks, fuel trucks, landscaping vehicles, you know, anyone that may be traversing the area um, is allowed to pass through there without, you know, harassment or restriction, essentially. Um, and then private ways are obviously ways that are true, true private ways. I know Bancorp plans will list a lot of ways as private ways because they're not public, but a true private way is a way that's restricted for access and use by people that are, you know, solely designated for the ability to use it by the, the owners of the way. Um, so a butter. So um, we looked a little further and, and, and I think Andrew was kind of guiding us to the fact that this was probably a uh, a semi-public way in this case, um, and we kind of attend to agree with that. And then we looked a little further kind of at a staff level and started pulling the deeds for this property and kind of some of the abutting properties. And one of the interesting parts that we found uh, on this way in particular is that this, this way was laid out for the first time in, in 1931 um, and was accepted to the land court. Um, and when looking at it, there's a number of interesting rights that are kind of on some of the abutting deeds. And uh, interestingly enough, in, in my experience, I haven't seen it a lot, is there's the ability for the folks that have interest in the way to be able to pass and repass in both directions to Pulpus Road. So when the road was originally laid out on the, the A plan through the land court, that road connected to Pulpus Road uh, where the paved section is now where you kind of go past Wingspread and Chacomo Road and then it loops around and kind of tied back into Rabbit Run Road and that road was all together and those properties that abut that the whole way around maintain the right to um, pass in both directions so they could essentially turn on on the the Wingspread end go around and come out the other way and, and vice versa uh, for all of those um, and that was again, originally laid out in 1931. So we kind of looked through it a little bit farther uh, and tried to do a little bit more digging, but I think, you know, kind of with the, the sheer number of people that have rights or access within the, the way and not necessarily 
knowing for 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 certain, you know, I couldn't talk to the, the original petitioners, but I think we also felt that kind of a wholesale relocation of the road and, you know, manipulation of the road outside of what regular maintenance is to the road and maintaining it at a, you know, kind of a, a, a safe and passable width uh, to, to service the properties may not be within, you know, a singular person's ability to do given the number of people that have interest in that way. So that was kind of the summary of that discussion that we had with Andrew and, and kind of looking at some of the other information we pulled together. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about our discussion um, that we did have about it, but hopefully that that goes away to answer the the idea of whether it's uh, public, semi-public or, or private road um, and control of of the way and, and, and how that works. Sorry, I know it's kind of confusing and we really just like straight heavy into like planning board territory for talking about ways and that kind of stuff, but that's um, where we're at with this one. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's helpful uh, to commissioners to understand the, the possibilities of this road, I guess. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to thank Jeff um, and Andrew Boris for putting the thorough effort into getting those questions answered, as I had been the one who specifically requested them. I also appreciate the project's representatives being willing to uh, wait until we had those answers to those questions. But at this point, I feel that all my questions have been answered and I uh, wholeheartedly agree that this road would be considered semi-public way in which the uh, applicant does not have direct control. So I think that the waiver being requested under section 103 uh, section 103, section 103 FB, FB, 103 FB, there we go, um, would be applicable to apply to this uh, project. Thank you, Seth. Sorry, not, not to correct him, just to be clear, it's 103 F3B, sorry. There's a lot of threes and Bs. One of three F three B. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? All right. If not, I I know we have everything to close for this one now. Um, is there a motion to close? Motion to close. The motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Ian. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. And um, thank you to all of the representatives for hanging on with this one. Another sharp pencil, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for all the comments and feedback. All right. Um, We're right. going to have to get him a new pencil sharpener for Christmas this year. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So this moves us on to Nantucket Islands Land Bank, Smooth Hummocks, south end of Westerwick Way, represented by Art Gasparo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the second hearing on the application for a seasonal set of aluminum stairs to uh, traverse the coastal bank um, to get to the beach. And um, we were waiting for sign off from Natural Heritage, which we re did receive a uh, letter of no take in between the meetings. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any additional questions or concerns that you might have with the application. Thank you, Art. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. I'll look and see if we have any questions from the public. My screen, it does not look like we have any questions from the public at this point. Uh, I 
I think we now have everything to close. Art, would you like to close? Yes, please. Uh, is there a motion to close? Motion to close. So motion made by Joe. Uh, is there a second? Seconded by Ian. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you, Art. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Waterfront Pacamo LLC at 17 Loretta Lane, uh, represented by Art Gasparo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm before you tonight to um, request some modifications to uh, an existing res developed residential property. And essentially there are two uh, red brick patios that the um, uh, own new owner would like to swap out to be um, granite pavers similar to um, to bluestone uh, dry laid same footprint just they just don't like the I think the aesthetic of the the red brick and then there is a section uh, there's an area of um, uh, shrubby vegetation uh, look shown in the circled red area uh, which is outside of the 50 foot buffer zone which they would like to um, convert to lawn area. And that's the extent of the proposal. I, I, if I may, the, if you would like me to go over the resource areas, we do have various resource areas. Uh, we're within the buffer zone to vegetated wetlands as well as a coastal bank, uh, portion of that coastal bank being by, um, uh, by policy due to topography. Thank you, Art. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Look. Ian? Yes, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to Art. Yes. Will we have any drainage issues, Art, considering that they're going to be substantially larger than the brick, and so the brick allows more water absorption? I, I don't think so. I don't think they're red, tight joint red brick is really any different um, in terms of, uh, you know, pervious area. Thank you, Art. I, I will add, I, I did, you know, explain that I, I thought it would be more complicated with the commission if the footprint was to be increased. So that's a big part of the application is really that they're maintaining that existing footprint. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? like no Jeff do we have any comments from the public on this one uh, at this point no and you do have all of the required information all right uh, art would you like to close yes please is there a motion to close motion made by Dave is there a second seconded by Mark so by roll vote Beal aye Engelborg aye Erisman aye Golding aye LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Randolph G. Sharp Jr. Trust <clears throat> at 49A Meadowview Drive. And this is represented by Brian Madden and Don Bracken. Uh, thank you very much, um, Brian Madden, for the record. Uh, we introduced this project, I think, two meetings ago uh, for the proposed new construction of a single family dwelling, pool, patio, and a driveway. Um, and at that point in time, we had some discussions about some of the design elements and then in indicated that we were going to do some additional soil testing on site, uh, which has been done. Um, the soil logs are uh, been added to the plan. Uh, but we found uh, relative to high groundwater, whether it be uh, from redox morphic features or from actual static standing water, uh, certainly variable across the property, uh, but uh, it was observed to be uh, high, higher groundwater was observed closer towards uh, the on-site small pond within the eastern portion of the site uh, that uh, Based on my review or looking at some of the historic aerials, I think 
uh, was excavated out for drainage purposes when the subdivision was initially uh, created. Um, but ultimately we, we took that high groundwater, the highest that we found on site. Sorry, that's not the plan. Yeah, we're on the wrong plan. Yeah. Um, and uh, we designed or modified both the bottom of the pool and the bottom of the foundation to be above high groundwater. Um, so we, we are not uh, anticipating any need for dewatering. We're not proposing to dewater. Um, those crawl space foundation depths and the pool depth uh, are set above high groundwater. Um, and also on this one, we are proposing um, some shallow subsurface infiltration systems to collect and treat runoff from the, the roof of the house and but also from the patio pool area. And um, just to reiterate, no structures within the 50 foot buffer zone. Uh, there's a existing driveway within the partially within the 25 foot buffer zone that we're relocating outside the 25 foot and uh, proposing to revegetate um, the areas within the, the 25 foot and propose to do a little invasive species management where there's some isolated uh, bush honeysuckle and autumn olive shrubs in that area. Uh, so we have requested a waiver for the project and um, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? For clarification to Mr. Madden, if I may. Um, yep. So when you say that the uh, bottom of the pool and the footing for, or the crawl space foundation for the structure are above high ground water, is that above the two foot separation or is that just above the actual groundwater level that you measured? Yep. Uh, it is within the two foot, uh, but it is above the high ground water and that's to the base of the footing um, and also to the base of the um, foundation for the pool. Thank you, Brian. Does that answer your question, Seth? It does. And well, it sort of does. And on the plan that was submitted, are the different locations that uh, you took soil data at represented? Where I'm getting to here is, I believe I mentioned it before, but I see less of an issue with having the footing of a structure used for residential purposes within that two foot separation to high groundwater. But I think an auxiliary structure like a pool that could be easily uh, designed with a different um, type of scenario, like a above ground pool or a shallower pool uh, doesn't really meet my concerns for the, the resource area there. Yeah, um, sorry, through the chair. Um, so we did take um, two test pits that are immediately adjacent to the pool. And both those uh, water levels and or redox levels, again, as I said earlier, they, they were high, higher groundwater closer to that pond uh, and then kind of lessening further away from that. Um, immediately adjacent to the pool, uh, based on those specific logs, we would meet the two foot separation. The, the variation in the high ground water was 17.8, closer towards um, the pond and then 15.8 uh, uh, adjacent to the pool. So we would get that two foot separation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, does that answer everything you wanted, Seth? It does, and I think it's worth um, calling out the uh, finding that documents the highly variable uh, groundwater depths at the site, given its 
pretty unique history when we get to the stage of creating order of conditions. Yes, thank you, Seth. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners about this project? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public? Sorry, my mouse decided not to work for a second. Uh, Emily, Molden, Emily Molden from the Nantucket Land Council commented that the crawl space at 49A is proposed to be six and a half feet, while the crawl space at 49 is proposed to be four feet, yet a, grain, a waiver to groundwater is requested to both. Is it possible for both to be four feet? Thank you for reading that comment, Jeff. Um, um, Brian, is it possible for both crawl spaces to be four feet? I, if I could just um, comment on, on this one, 49A, um, that's the bottom of the footing, plus you have the depth of the footing and the depth of the, um, of the four inches for the slab on the, on, on the footing. So it's, um, so that ends up being just, just over a foot. So nine, so yeah, it ends up being about a five foot crawl space. So just over five feet. And, you know, that's, it's still considered a crawl space, but we think it's where we're still above the groundwater. If we can get that uh, extra foot rather than four feet, it does make a big difference for the contractor or anybody, you know, being able to use that crawl space. I've been in a lot of crawl spaces and I know it makes a lot of a big difference. So. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for that explanation, Don. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Any other thoughts from commissioners? It's like, no. Uh, Jeff? More comment from the public, uh, back from Emily from the Land Council again. She said, I would also like to agree with Commissioner Engelberg that the waiver as requested cannot necessarily be justified for the pool. I understand the representatives. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I do have to agree with Seth. Um, on the two foot separation um, that it's easier to grant for, you know, a livable structure uh, that would make the site unusable without it. Um, but something like a pool um, isn't, you know, necessary. So uh, it is more difficult to grant those waivers. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I can clarify my comment even further, I think beyond that, there's a significant difference between a, a structure that is holding water in it, a pool, uh, treated water, and if there was any type of failure to that structure, that, that treated water or untreated water is going directly into the groundwater versus just the footing of a, a livable structure. It's a difference. There's still a hydraulic issue. Um, I still don't think it's really great for the resource area and I, I like to see it avoided when possible, but I think the impact of a pool is much more significant than the impact of a footing. Thank you for that further clarification, Seth. Um, Jeff, do we have any other public comment? Okay. Nope. Any last thoughts from commissioners? No, Jeff, do we have everything we'd need to close? Yes, you have all of the required information. Okay. Uh, Brian or Don, would you like to close? Please. Uh, okay. If I could just make one comment. If when you deliberate on the order of conditions, um, you know, if you could, um, you know, specify if you're not gonna grant the waiver to the bottom of the pool, if you're willing to grant any waiver whatsoever, whether it be six inches or 12 inches, you know, we could probably adjust that grade about another six inches and bring it up another six inches. But if something, if you, if, if you could put something specifically in there, so if we revise the depth of the pool, you know, we can comply with the order conditions. Just something to consider, please. Oh, uh, Brian? Yeah, sorry, just as a point of clarification, I, I think we would still be meeting that two foot separation high groundwater for the pool based on those 
immediately adjacent test pits. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Ian? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I'm confused. I thought there was no waiver necessary after what Brian had said for the pool. Am I mistaken? S specifically for the pool, yes, based on the two immediate uh, adjacent test pits. Thank you. So it would only be for the house footings right. and the crawl space. And, um, and Don is saying uh, that he can modify the crawl space uh, I think he was just referring to the pool with those modifications. It, it was my impression based on the conversation I heard that possibly the commission, you know, may not accept the two closest test pits and look at the other groundwater data and not issue the waiver on the pool depth that's proposed. So I was confused myself, I guess. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't think I'm helping the confusion. I'm feeling a little bit slow tonight, unfortunately, so I apologize. Um, I think we have everything to close. Is there a motion to close? Motion to close. A motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Randolph G. Sharp Jr. Trust at 49 Meadowview Drive, also represented by Brian Madden and Don Bracken. Thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden, for the record. Uh, this proposed project adjacent to 49A um, is new construction of a proposed house, uh, dry laid stone patio, pool and guest house uh, with a small pervious driveway access. All structures are outside the 50 foot. Um, no work within the 25 foot, less than 50% alteration between the 25 and 50 foot. Uh, we are proposing to have subsurface infiltration systems to capture a runoff from the structures and from the patio pool area. Um, I, we have done soil testing also on this lot and set the bottom of the crawl space foundation footing above high ground water and set the bottom of the pool depth, uh, five foot pool depth uh, above high ground or high ground water as well. Uh, it is within the two foot separation as currently proposed. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to questions at this point. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brian, my same comment regarding the pool applies here. I think if you would be amenable to revising the design of the pool to get it out of the two foot separation of high groundwater, it would better meet the interests that we protect. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Ian? Yes, I agree with Seth completely. And I, as far as I feel that's, we've been stating that for quite some time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? I would say I agree if we can revise that pool to be out of the two foot separation, I think that would be uh, beneficial for this site. Yeah, we, we can certainly take a look at that. Um, you know, often, you know, when we're talking about elevating the pool, um, you know, comes part and parcel with it is either adding more retaining walls or doing more regrading, more fill. Um, you know, something that we could take a closer look at. Um, Don, I don't know if you have anything to add at this point, but it's something we can evaluate further. Um, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for looking that, uh, looking at that, Brian. I know in prior applications that you've submitted, there's been uh, proposals to use the shallow fiberglass. I think that's worth looking into, and always looking into possibility of above ground pool. I know aesthetically some people don't like it, but 
uh, if that's a way to have the same amenity while protecting the resource, I think it should be considered. Thank you, Seth. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public? We, we do, Emily Bowman from the Nantucket Land Council um, asked the question, she said, I forgot to ask on the previous application, but what will the distance be from the infiltration chambers to high groundwater? Is a waiver required for them? As they are part of the waiver justification, has a diagram or additional information on their design been provided to the file? So the I answered a little bit in the chat, so I'll just answer it for everyone too. So infiltration units and chambers are not considered to be structures by the regulations, kind of similar to like septic tanks and such. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily require that waiver to the two foot separation to groundwater. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Brian? Yeah, and I think Don could elaborate on this uh, point, but we, we wouldn't be sticking those in groundwater. Those would be shallow infiltration systems, um, you know, the typical chamber beds um, that would be set above high groundwater, um, so they infiltrate. Thank That's you. Don. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Any kind of final thoughts from commissioners? Um, so, Brian, are you willing to look at some pool revisions? Yeah, we'll request continuous to June 10th. Okay. Um, thank you. So, this will uh, continue to June 10th then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this moves us on to Drake Real Estate LLC at Two Hornbeam Road, represented by Brian Madden and Don Bracken. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden, for the record. Um, this project uh, involves the, the, a proposed pool, patio, uh, pool shed, and outdoor shower area. The uh, pool itself is outside the 50 foot buffer zone and it will meet the two foot uh, separation of high groundwater uh, based on observations we've taken in the existing well that's immediately to the west and also um, wetland elevations uh, at the A series wetland. Um, and as proposed, um, there are no uh, waivers uh, requested or required for this project. And um, with that, I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public at this point? Uh, do we have everything we'd need to close this one? Yes, you do. Well, I okay. think we're waiting on heritage for this. Looks like Jeff's maybe checking on that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is partially within. Okay. Um, well, in that case, it sounds like we'll probably have to continue till June 10th. Yep, so yeah. I, I, maybe that, I was just confused because we reviewed the application. Um, it's checked no for whether it was within or not. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it, just to explain that a little bit more, it's um, that it's not within estimated habitat, but it's within priority habitat. Priority and it was it was so close and it's going to overlap so uh, a copy of the notice was submitted to heritage uh, but you know the way to check that off is no so all right sorry for the confusion no problem that's fair that's their review not ours so we're waiting for heritage okay so um it sounds like brian you'd like to continue for two weeks till june 10th yes okay um, so we will continue this for natural heritage. Oh, real quick. Oh, okay, Sorry, yeah. I, 
I really apologize. And, and I might've missed it, but it just came in right as you were continuing. But just for Brian, in case he wants to adjust the plan, uh, Emily from the land council did say that there's a portion of patio within the 50 foot buffer zone that is not labeled as bluestone patio. She was just hoping that the patio materials could be clarified before the next meeting. Um, just north of the pool or closer to the house, do you know? Uh, why don't I'll find out? Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll connect back with you with, with her okay. question since we're being continued. So, yeah, okay. perfect. Um, well, hopefully, we'll get all this settled before June 10th. Um, and um, this will continue until then. So, thank you guys. Thanks. Uh, and that moves us on to 87 Eel Point Road Realty Trust at 87 Eel Point Road, represented by Brian Madden and Don Bracken. Madam Chair? Yes. I will be recusing myself from this. Okay, thank you, Seth. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Brian Madden, uh, the proposed project involves uh, the relocation and renovation of the existing single family dwelling on the uh, subject parcel. Uh, you can see that a portion of the existing dwelling is within the 50 foot buffer zone to the coastal bank. Uh, this is a site that um, there has been some shoreline protection measures installed in the past. I believe a certificate of compliance has been issued for that work. Uh, but basically um, it's relocating everything further to the south outside of uh, the buffer zone. Um, there is a, a proposed um, cabana patio pool area um, that is all aside from a small corner of the patio all outside the 100 foot buffer zone to the coastal dune coastal bank rather and um, you know we also identified the limits of the existing beach grass um, this is a scenario where there is kind of a windswept uh, dune ish area at the top of the bank uh, that's not doesn't meet the definition of a coastal bank, but we have um, designed to accommodate for that um, with all structures and project elements being outside the 50 foot buffer zone to that beach grass limit. Um, uh, the areas within the work footprint will be restored um, because we are migrating everything further to the south. Uh, outside of existing developed conditions, Heritage is requiring a botanical survey on uh, this property. Uh, but, but that is all outside the commission's jurisdiction. Um, so I guess what I'd like to ask the question as part of the presentation here is if the commission would be uh, willing to close the public hearing um, contingent upon uh, the results of, of the natural heritage review process. Obviously, if um, you know rare plants are found, the project will need to be modified and presumably we may need to come back to you if that work is within jurisdictional areas. But I think from um, buffer zone perspective, you know, we're moving everything outside the, the 100 foot um, for the most part and um, with that, I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, and Jeff, I guess I have a question for you. Um, my thought is it would be fine for us to issue, um, you know, given. Um, most of the heritage is outside of our jurisdiction. Do you agree that that would be fine for us to do? I think at this very specific case, yes, that would be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the public on this one? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm just waiting to sort them out here for a second. Uh, so Emily from the Nantucket Land Council again, says, we appreciate the relocation of the structure away from the top of the bank. I would like to suggest that the commission ask the applicant to revegetate the existing building site with beach grass, rather than creating a lawn area with irrigation, et cetera. 
as this bank is being stabilized and revegetated, the additional beach grass plantings on top of the bank at this site would be much more supportive and in keeping with the additional erosion control work taking place at this site. Thank you for reading those, Jeff. Um, Brian, is that something the client would be amenable to? Um, I, their, the intent and desire is to have that be lawn area and we would expect that all the typical um, conditions be put on to the project relative to fertilizer limitations and irrigation. Um, all the existing lawn and portion of the structure to be converted to lawn is all outside the, the 25 foot buffer zone. Um, so it, you know, it would comply with the regulations. Um, thank you, um, for explaining that. Um, it would be great if we could have up to the 50 <laughs> in this case, but I, I realized that, um, most people want lawn instead of beach grass on their properties. Um, any, uh, thoughts from other commissioners on this one? Uh, Ian? I, I think that's a worthy suggestion from the, from Emily. How about a compromise, bringing it out another 10 feet? And, you know, I, I wish we'd get around to revising our regulations, <laughs> I have to say, you know? <clears throat> yep, the list for us is long right now. It is. And, you know? Yeah. Uh, Joe? Is the... Uh, vegetation up there? Is it beach grass or what's, or is it a little scrub? I'm just so, curious if that's the right uh, method, methodology of replanting. Currently it's all beach grass and I think okay. it's primarily all old plugs. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with Ashley and Ian. I'd like to see some of that lawn, if not most of it, produced. Yeah, I'm not in a position to make that decision right now, but I can take it back to the clients for review. Okay. Um, so in that case, um, I don't think we have any more comments or questions. Uh, would you like to continue this one until June 10th then? Uh, please. Okay. Um, so this will continue until June 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to amended orders of conditions. Uh, we have Wallach Ack LLC at 45 Hulbert Ave, represented by Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a project um, that has been approved for the uh, construction of a house. And um, the, um, the owner would like to bury a propane tank just north of the parking area, approximately 30 feet away from the uh, coastal dune boundary. And um, the propane tank will be anchored on a concrete slab. Um, and any uh, dewatering that may be uh, necessary temporarily shouldn't be more than a couple of days worth will be uh, pumped to a, a settlement chamber and then pumped into a um, temporary dewatering um, location on the beach, just on the north side of the um, uh, bulkhead. Uh, it will be surrounded by hay bales and um, there is already a um, discharge permit for that um, that was issued uh, for the uh, footings installation for the new house. So um, I don't expect that any dewatering would take place for more than a couple of days, just until they can um, uh, lift the, uh, the slab in and set the propane tank and then backfill over it. Um, so this is a, an amendment request to an existing order of conditions. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it looks like Joe has a question or comment. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through the chair, Jeff, have you had the fire department review this because they have new requirements for underground tanks? So it's ten feet from a house, ten be ten feet from a uh, lot line, and then if it's in front of a drive, we have to put up some fencing. So you may want to get there. The cut. Um, I'll take through the chair. Um, uh, I will take your comments back to the contractor who's running the show, but the um, the setback requirements are met and I will remind the contractor that um, a fencing element is required to prevent vehicles from driving over the, the tank. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're in the process of competing regulations here now, but would that compensatory fencing uh, cause an issue for our wetland regulations here because this is inside of the 50 foot buffer to the coastal dune. So could it be a type of fencing that is not considered, considered structural? That's a, a great question. Um, it looks like Jeff Carlson maybe has an answer. Yeah, I would just say, I think in this case, Seth, the, the only real structural fence, I'm not sure if it qualifies, would probably have to be least put rail fencing. You know, consider it to be structural. But I, I don't know if that meets the requirement. I certainly don't know fire code. Yeah, I just, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so uh, Jeff, I just met with Sean Mitchell on a site and he was great and walked, I walked him through, um, our needs and we were very restricted in codfish park and he was very helpful and given suggestions. So I would recommend you call the Nantucket fire department and speak to him directly. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Jeff, do we have anything from the public on this one? Yes, we just have one from uh, the land council again, and it says the, the plan shows the location of the proposed pad and tank to be approximate, in quotes. How close is this depicted location likely to be? Uh, Jeff Blackwell, do you have a response to that? Well, given the, um, the proposed subsurface drainage structures and the location of the um, parking area, the only variable might be a couple of feet uh, east and west, but even with a, a minor variation, it would, the uh, tank would be more than 25 feet away from the coastal dune. Um, I will stake the location for the contractor before they begin the installation. So um, we, we're sure that it will be very close to the location shown. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any other uh, comments or questions from commissioners? Um, so Jeff, do we have everything we'd need to issue the amended order? Yes, if you wanted to, you could close and issue. Okay. Um, I know Jeff Blackwell, there have been a couple of questions. Do you want to try and get those answered and continue? Um, no, I, I don't. I, I've heard the recommendations of the um, um, commission members and um, I, I'm hearing that the only acceptable sort of fencing is a sport rail fence. I mean, um, there's major portions of the house itself that are well within the 50 feet, but that was a historical um, situation from the, the, the house that was removed from the site. Um, I, uh, I, I guess I would like to understand if your, your, direct, your direction is that uh, an 18 foot length of picket fence, for instance, is unacceptable, whereas the split rail fence of the same similar length is, I, I hear that that's acceptable, but I guess um, 
on this particular site and, and its historic use and other level of development, it, I, I guess I'd, I'd have a difficult time explaining to the owner how a stretch of picket fence is uh, unacceptable, whereas split rail is. So I, can you give me any help with that? Um, so under our regulations, we allow split rail as non-structural to demarcate boundaries and things like that, edges of buffer zones. Uh, we've never allowed picket fence uh, to be a non-structural uh, element. Uh, I think that would also impact, well, it would depend on the, the pickets, but flow through and some other uh, issues on this site. Um, so, I mean, they could obviously apply for an amended order with a waiver uh, for a different type of fence that might be structural, uh, that would be, you know, within their um, right to do. Uh, it looks like Joe has a comment or yes, question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through the chair to Jeff. Jeff, he, Sean may give you a waiver or just say um, your distance is fine or rotate the tank 90 degrees and you may not have to do the fencing. So that's why I'm saying go talk to him. But after the two explosions, uh, they be they more or less want to review every tight site. If so, that's why I'm saying just go talk to him. You may not need the fence, but just have a conversation with him. I just want to give you a heads up before you. Thank get you. The I I would like to close with the understanding that uh, only a split rail fence is acceptable if it's required by the uh, fire department. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It looks like Ian has a question or comment before we close. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and please, um, through you to Jeff, um, refresh my memory. Would you, Jeff, please, didn't we grant a waiver for a picket fence for the utility company down by Water Street? Or we had that discussion about the fence and they ended up with a picket fence. Yeah, I think they maybe raised that one up. There was some compromise there. Jeff Carlson, do you remember that one? Maybe I'm not describing it well enough, but at the uh, it's not ring, ringing a bell. I mean, we have a lot of applications, okay. so may, well, it, it may just be lost in the details for, for which one it is. It's no, the Candle it's, Candle Street uh, Electric Company where they you, had. <laughs> Thank you. I right, remember. So it. I, I, I do remember that. So <laughs> they also the Candle Street Electric Company one also had other security requirements involved. For that site as well that's a little bit a little trickier on that site so mm. and i also remember on that too the resource area there was different resource area the candle street substation site is primarily land subject to coastal storm flowage and i think the buffer zone from the coastal bank uh from the bulkhead just caught the corner of that site but i think the fencing in question is just within land subject to coastal storm flowage but that is trying to dig it out of the memory banks too but we could pull it quick enough if you really wanted to. Well, it, you, you did a much better job than I did. So thank you, Jeff. Okay. Um, I'm just glad Seth figured out which, which site it was for sure. That was helpful. Yeah, and I I remember it being the same, the resource area being the land subject to coastal storm flowage as well. Um, all right, so it looks like um, Jeff Blackwell would like to close tonight and he can come back, you know, with a further amendment if there's, you know, fencing issues. Um, so is there a motion to issue the amended order? Looks like motion made by Mark. Is there a second? Second, Sec Joe. Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and Thank that you. Moves us, you're welcome. Uh, that moves us on to Snowden at 11 Massachusetts Ave, represented also by <clears throat> Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is also a, an amendment request to add a um, elevated walkway to replace a uh, uh, long used footpath that um, crosses through uh, a vegetated wetland, a salt marsh, and ends up on a, um, 
a coastal beach. Um, the uh, owners would like to construct a, um, a, foot, a uh, raised boardwalk, which will be supported by helical anchors. And um, this will keep the disturbance to the salt marsh primarily, um, uh, will eliminate and, and allow revegetation and reestablishment of the uh, uh, grasses within the marsh. Um, next, there was a, a boardwalk installed just next door to the west, and um, it had to be replaced because there were some high storm water events that uh, that uh, tore up the um, you know post the traditional post supported um, boardwalk. So that was replaced with a, also with a helical, helical anchor supported uh, boardwalk. Um, that's about it. I know that um, we don't have a response from Natural Heritage. We're still within the 30 days. So we'll have to go to the June 10th meeting um, anyway, but I'll, I'll uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Joe? Uh, through the chair, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Jeff, what's the width of the walkway? I didn't see that on your drawings. I think it's described um, in the narrative as three and a half feet. Oh, sorry if I missed that. It's described as 36 inches, I believe, on the, on the plan. Oh, you're right. You're right. I'm thinking of another project. Yeah. It's 36 inches. Yes. Yes. Excuse Thank me. Thank you. And uh, so, Jeff, I'm, I'm pleased that they're keeping it where they don't have to have rails. So, thank you. Yeah, that is definitely important for uh, the visuals over these salt marshes. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Okay. Um, so Jeff Blackwell, uh, it looks like we need to wait for Heritage. So we'll continue this until June 10th. Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, so that moves us on to minor modifications. We have AC 86 QR LLC at 86 Quidnet Road, represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden for the applicant. Uh, the minor modification um, involves um, additions of uh, some window wells and an area way. Uh, all that work is outside the 50 foot buffer zone. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Brian. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have everything we'd need to issue the minor mod? Yes. Okay. Um, Ian? So moved. Okay, Second. seconded by Joe, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to certificates of compliance. We have more at 14 Moore's End Lane. Uh, it looks like Jeff Carlson will be taking this one. Yes, so this is a uh, 14 Moore's End Lane. This uh, really old permit was originally for a septic installation uh, on that property. This permit is so old, they've now converted onto town sewer. So with the septic system, it's going to be in use. So uh, we dug through and it had a certificate of compliance from the Board of Health. So we're recommending that it could be issued uh, at this point, closing out this old, old permit. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? If not, is there a motion to issue the cert? Motion to issue. A motion made by Joe, seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? 
Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, then we have Lynn F. Berlin at 2 Francis Street. Uh, Jeff, will you be taking this one? Yeah, I certainly can. Okay. Um, don't want to bring it on Arts Parade if you want to do it, but this was for, uh, if anyone remembers, the installation of a driveway off of Francis Street, uh, kind of within that, that roadway layout. Um, the work has been completed. I know I literally drive by it like a thousand times a day as it was going on. So uh, we've inspected it many, many times and the work was done in compliance. So we don't have any ongoing conditions to recommend for this. Okay. Um, Art, sorry, I didn't have you listed on this one. Do you have anything to add? No. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, if not, is there a motion to issue the cert? So moved. Uh, so I'll give uh, Mark the motion and Ian the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Dunphy and Colella at 32 Tennessee Ave. And it looks like Jeff Carlson will take this one. I'm going to turn this one over to Art. Oh, this is an Art? Okay, go ahead, Art. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the project for the creation of an elevated um, walkway uh, from Tennessee Ave that um, went through the buffer zone and partially through the resource area. And it is um, uh, half boardwalk and half fiber grate in the resource area. The posts were all installed by hand. And um, the um, uh, I would say that the boardwalk was so close to what was proposed that I don't even think I had to redraft it. And we as built the whole thing. It was <laughs> exactly in the spot that we staked out. Nice. That's nothing short of miraculous. <laughs> Um, are there any uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, have you been out to check the site? Yes, we have. Uh, we do have a, a suggestion for some ongoing conditions on this though. Just in case people want, let me see if I can bring them up in case people are curious. But uh, we are suggesting that conditions um, essentially 21 through 26 and then condition 33 be listed as okay. thank you jeff and a lot of that relates to the invasive species management and some of the maintenance of the, the board okay um would somebody like to make a motion to issue the cert with ongoing conditions 21 through 26 and condition 33 so move, Madam Chair. So motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Bailey at 85 Sankety Road. Um, I have Jeff Carlson listed at this one. Are you gonna take this one, Jeff? Yes, I will take this one. Sorry, let me catch up here for a second. <coughs> Try to do too many things at once. Um, so this is one where the original work was permitted and the lot has since been subdivided. And what we're looking to do is get a partial certificate that releases lot four on land court plan 34502-C, released from the order of conditions. It's not where the project's occurring, it's the new lot that nothing is happening on, but the order is recorded against it and they're just looking to clear it off the title on the new lot. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Or is there a motion to issue the cert so moved. Uh, motion made by Seth. Is there a second? <clears throat> Seconded by Dave. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. 
Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to 55 Grove Lane LLC at 55 Grove Lane. Uh, and this is represented by Mark Ritz. Uh, good evening, Mark Ritz from Site Design, representing the applicants at 55 Grove. Um, this was an original uh, project that allowed a redevelopment of a residentially developed site. Uh, there was an existing driveway that came in between two wetlands and there were uh, wetlands on uh, the uh, east side of the property. Uh, under the original development, uh, there was lawn going down pretty much to the wetland and part of the project required some replanting of portions of the buffer zone, uh, seeding with a native uh, buffer zone seed mix, which has been done. The rest of the development work has been done uh, in compliance with the original approval. So happy to answer any questions, but uh, we feel everything has been done substantially in compliance. Thank you, Mark. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Jeff, has staff been out to check this one? Uh, yes, we have, and we'd uh, agree that it's in compliance, but we're gonna recommend that you guys have condition 20, that there's no permanent dewatering allowed as an ongoing condition. I know there's no dewatering going on, but we took the time to put it in the order, so we can carry it forward. Thank you, Jeff. Um, is there a motion to issue the cert with ongoing condition number 20? Motion made by Dave. I'll move. Uh, and Joe, I'll give you the second. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Arison, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, thank, that you. Moves, thank you. Thank uh, you. That moves us on to Montgomery at 33 North Liberty Street. Yes, this is another, I'll take this one. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, like ancient permit for us that was for the construction of some retaining walls and some patios. Uh, in kind of that Louis Pond area. And the, the as-built has not matching in the permitted conditions. I will tell you that if this were permitted today, uh, we'll probably not get a permit because it's some work inside the 50. Uh, but again, it, it was all constructed in compliance with the original permit. Um, and we're recommending that it could be issued and didn't really have any conditions on it. So that it could be issued without any ongoing conditions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to issue the certificate? So move, Madam Chair. Motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Mark. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Arisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to orders of conditions. Uh, Jeff sent these out earlier, so hopefully you guys have, have these in your email. Uh, and we will start with Town of Nantucket DPW uh, island-wide. I'll give everyone a second to bring it up. I'm happy to screen share too, if, if that's helpful for people. Um, but I did try to get them out. I know I said a little earlier than normal today, but. I had to pick kids up from school. So accelerate my process. Um, so on this one, I just wanted to talk about this for a second. Obviously, we don't have to issue this one tonight. We have 21 days to issue, so we can take a look at it. And if there's a lot of suggestions or things, we, we can certainly add them in uh, if we think it's good. But I do think with this one and with the Land Bank one, both, where they put together pretty detailed narratives for, for heritage, in this case, and the Land Bank included their manual of procedures in it. I also think for both of these, we're going to recommend attaching those protocols specifically to the order, even if they're like 30 pages long, like the land banks, like just having it in the order, whole thing complete. So there's no 
question or whatever it is, it's all in there um, to have that in there. So that also shortens up the, the number of conditions a little bit. Uh, so just to kind of run through these, kind of going back through the minutes uh, and looking at discussions, kind of the first ones we started off with, uh, obviously number 19 is this yearly summary of activities uh, to be discussed at a public meeting and reviewed so we can kind of go through everything with them, make sure everything's working okay. If there's issues or concerns, we can deal with those uh, as, part of the, as part of the public meeting. If there are changes, they'll go in under uh, a minor, moderate amended order as the condition calls out. Uh, 20, this was a suggestion from Commissioner Topham, I believe, that uh, the applicant shall submit a monthly plan to the commission staff at least one week prior to the month, starting documenting expected work that's really brutal language, but uh, documenting expected work to perform. So I think the intent of that is to get that a week in advance so we can distribute that to the commission so people can go see anywhere that they're planning on working um, and can also kind of keep track of what's going on uh, with just kind of that one month again, because I think it's be difficult for, for public work sometimes to know um, two months in advance where they think they're going to be uh, specifically uh, because stuff changes, you know, like water mains get cut into and you don't know what work you're going to have to fix. So uh, that stuff happens. Uh, 21, uh, applicant shall provide a, a report with photographs for the annual review at a regular meeting. And that will also include the any fertilizer, pesticide, or herbicide applied on each property in a review of activities. So it's a little bit like number 19, just a little rehab of it. 22 is that all fertilizer, herbicide, and pesticide shall be applied by a licensed applicator. And then number 23 is one that kind of came from the land bank discussion, but I, I wanted to include a condition like this as a little bit of a catch, because I think we all know that there's gonna be stuff where the debate is gonna come in. Is this covered? Is it not covered? Uh, but it sets out a procedure that it's not clearly defined within the maintenance guide. Um, or should public use require greater maintenance, the applicant shall contact the commission staff for review of the activity. And then I just outline what it is. So it's just a written request, a site visit with the applicant and our staff, and then we'll issue a written determination. So that determination may be something as simple as, we feel that it's in keeping with the permit, You know, please proceed and include it in your, your annual reporting, or the determination may simply be we're not sure, so you need to appear in front of the commission to discuss it as a minor modification or amended order of conditions. So I just wanted to have some sort of catch in there, knowing that there always are activities that are on the fringe of whether it's included or not, uh, but a very clear procedure that that written request has to come in and some sort of review and discussion and site visit that goes on uh, to be sure that there's nothing that that slips through the cracks or if it needs whatever level of review it needs that it gets it. So we don't have a, you know, a whoops moment later or this really wasn't included in the permit and it should have been. Just wanted to be a very clear procedure of, of, of notice of what that is. So that was kind of my thoughts on that. And that was kind of a, a, a selfish condition, but I, I think it was something that was trying to, to make it there. And then I think we're open to whatever suggestions. It's obviously our first run at one of these kind of general notices that uh, was there, but those are what I kind of tracked as main points from the minutes with the inclusion of the actual work protocols that they filed with Heritage or, or their other way uh, attached to it as well. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ian? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Jeff, for uh, in particular with that last paragraph. And uh, Joseph, that was a great suggestion. You will be sorely missed. And then in terms of uh, presenting this for us in two weeks time, the, I, I'd like to note that um, the, the natural heritage uh, letter, I thought it was slightly disingenuous to say that they had signed off on it um, because in fact, they said specifically that the, should I read it or should I not bother to read the the, it says provided the conditions above is included in any approved order of conditions issued by the Conservation Commission, et cetera, et cetera. And it's two paragraphs of what nat natural heritage wants included in our orders of conditions. 
And so I, it would seem that it behooves us to add that as a condition going yeah. forward. I think that's what Jeff was saying with attaching their condition right. to our order. Uh, but Jeff, would you like to clarify? Yeah, right. so th there's kind of two separate attachments. One is is the actual information that they submitted to Heritage that describes the work that they want to conduct. That will be attached. Uh, the one thing that's kind of tricky with Heritage is they say those have to be included, but then when you dig into the meat and potatoes of their actual regulations, they specifically tell you that any determination letter that's not a uh, no take, uh, no adverse impact uh, determination has to get attached to the order of conditions in its totality anyways. So that whole letter, Ian, that you read also has to get attached to the order uh, to satisfy Heritage. Then Heritage gets a complete copy of the order of conditions as well. So it's kind of funny. They tell you, you have to include it in the order, but then when you go back to the parent regulation, they tell you that you have to include the whole letter in the order. So you don't really get any choice one way or the other. Uh, well, thank, to meet you the requirements. thank you, Madam Chair. It's typical state government, you know, we're going to tell you to do something extra, but then tell you how to do it somewhere else that contradicts what we're telling you what to do. So that's, um, that's how it works. Any other, yeah, right. um, any other questions or comments from commissioners about this one? Uh, Jeff? Uh, if it helps, Ian, I, I'm happy to put, I, I usually put it in there, I hadn't thought about it, under the additional findings where it says these areas fall inside map habitat areas and required uh, NHESP review. Um, but I'll add a sentence that says a copy of their determination is attached to this order. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think we all want to make sure that um, there's no that the leeway is kept under control. Let's put it that way. Yeah, connect all the dots. Exactly. What? Connect all the dots. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Joseph. Um, all right. Uh, if there are no additional thoughts, um, would somebody like to make a motion to approve as amended? So moved, Madam Chair. A motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Ian. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Recused. Oh, I forgot about that. Sorry, Dave. Uh, Topham? Aye. All right, so this carries unanimously with Commissioner Lafleur recused. Um, but did not close Surfside Beach. Uh, so this moves us on to Sweet Meadow, Sylvia Lane at 74 Westchester Street. Yes, this was Paul Santos' project that was there. I think Seth had a, an addition that he wanted to make, so. Um, Seth? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. It's just one minor detail in permit overview. Uh, it's removal of existing vegetation, planting of native vegetation. I don't think they're planting anything anymore and it's non-native vegetation that they're removing. Thank you for those clarifications, Seth. Yeah, thanks, Seth. Uh, any other thoughts or comments from commissioners on this one? If not, uh, is there a motion to approve as amended? A motion made by Dave. Is there a second? Seconded by Ian, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Harrison, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. And that moves us on to MLR3 uh, LLC at 
45 Shakamo Road, Shakamo Road layout. All right. So I just had on this one, I had an additional finding that we don't normally have, but I thought it was important in this case to memorialize uh, that the commission finds that the roadway was in existence prior to 1972 and predates the Wetlands Protection Act and Town of Nantucket Wetlands Bylaw, um, especially given the conversation we had tonight where that road was originally installed in, in 19, I might even say it was probably installed prior to, it was officially laid out and adopted by the land court in 1931. So. Um, from what I've heard and kind of digging through aerials and things, it seems like that roadway had been in even prior to that, but it is definitely pre-72. Uh, I thought that was important to call out because um, then when we get into the waiver, um, I had the sentence that the given the Higgs historic existence of the roadway and proposed alterations being on the landward side of the roadway from the resource areas, the commission finds that portions of the buffer zone between the project area and the resource area are previously altered and not within control of the applicant in there to keep it within that qualification um, there. But I think I'd also like to add, given the historic existence of the roadway, um, it being a semi-public roadway, and then, and proposed alterations. Sorry, I just forgot to include that in the, in the writing. I did so much learning about private and public roadways for this that I forgot some of the details. But Andrew was a dizzying amount of knowledge about these things. It was a much longer phone call than I had anticipated. So, but it was good. I learned a lot. I think we all learned a lot from this one. Uh, Mark, do you have a question or comment? I have a question. Um, it says that the uh, Area is not within the control of the applicant or granting him a waiver. So is, will he be doing the work on the roadway, do you think, Jeff? He'll be doing the work on the, the side of the roadway that they've proposed to do the work on. Yes. Even though he has no control over it. So he's just doing it. So I, I think this is what I, I think I must have done a poor job explaining this earlier. So there's a difference between having the ability and the right to maintain and improve an area or the ability to control the area. I think when Andrew and I talked about it, controlling would be the ability to you know restrict access or wholesale like relocate portions of the road and change it greatly where widening or improving shoulders or, you know, regrading roads would fall more within the ability of someone with a fee interest uh, to maintain and keep that passable, but not necessarily be able to restrict. Like, I don't think that in this case, this person would be able to like gate off both sides to go past there because there are other people that have rights within that way um, as well. So are there no restrictions on what he can and can't do along the roadway, Jeff? Well, they'd have it, to come to us. Well, it, it would require permits. There, He's come to us and we're saying the waiver is granted, go. So the, the waiver is granted, but it's specific to the work that he's proposed to, to grade off the foot to 18 inches on the landward side of the road. But they would still have any any of the people that have interest in that roadway would still have the ability to to work to like regrade that road or maintain it in place as it is um, or to do other improvements whether it's there as long as they're not altering the ability for others to to access or changing the roadway or relocating it to an area that's either you know outside of the layout or significantly different enough to cause harm to other people with rights in the way I'm yeah. troubled by it, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Madam Chair, through you to Jeff, or um, perhaps if we added the word sole, if you're not within the sole control of the applicant, would that help clarify uh, the point that Mark is trying to make? 
Uh, and then uh, Jeff, do you have a response? And then Seth, I'll go to you. I think that's totally fine. If, if, if people would like to add that word. Um, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Jeff. I think in my mind, you know, it is really sole or direct control that we're talking about. And this is not necessarily germane to the specific uh, order of conditions, but we probably could clean this waiver language up a little bit when we do our regulatory update to be less confusing. Yes, I, I think our regulatory update hearings are gonna be um, very important coming up. Again, the list is very long for us. I just need um, to get away from being bogged down with other stuff. Yeah, uh, Mark. Uh, through the chair, actually, Jeff, what, what would be the implications if we denied the waiver? Well, if you denied the waiver, they wouldn't be able to, to do the project, obviously, because it requires a waiver to be done. And then that could be subject to appeal. So. I guess I, I, I knew that, but I was just, uh, I'm still troubled by the whole thing. Go so and, and I, I'll be perfectly honest with, with, with the board too, Mark. I, I think in this case, if if we were not going to grant the waiver, I would probably recommend issuing a, a positive order because it meets the state performance standards. The state the state doesn't have the same requirement that we do for this kind of roadway, um, and probably doing a split order and then doing it locally. But um, I guess it's my it's my thought, Jeff, that he doesn't need a waiver. He has a perfectly reasonable access now to his lot. You think he doesn't need improvements to the road that would require the waiver? I've, I've driven the road in my wide Jeep and uh, it was fine. I I know what this, the sub context is and it, it's, it's not within our purview to rule on that, but I don't think he needs a waiver. I mean, yeah, I don't think he needs a waiver. He can, he can build on that lot without uh, the waiver. Without improving the road, right. Um, you are talking about working on the other side of the road from the wetland, right? So right, but that's, that's I mean, building 25 feet up. In such a way that it's absolutely clear that it doesn't impose on the side of the road towards the wetland? Um, I mean, it says all work shall be performed in accordance with the site work and description. I feel like the site work was pretty clear that they were not going to do work on that side, but maybe we should clarify that this does not allow work on the wetland side. Jeff? Yeah, so in the, the waiver discussion that's there, there is a statement that says, and proposed alterations being on the landward side of the roadway away, excuse me, I should have the word, away from the resource area. So we do talk about it. We can call it out again separately as well. Thank you. <laughs> That's still within 25 feet? Yeah, it's still within the yeah. 20 feet. Yeah. Yeah, a, a portion of it is, uh, some of the work that's being proposed, Mark, is outside of the 25 feet, but there is a portion inside. Any other thoughts from commissioners about this one? Like, no. Um, so at this point, uh, does somebody want to make a motion to approve as amended? Motion made by Dave. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? No. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? No. LaFleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, so that carries with Commissioners Beal and Golding opposed. Thank you everyone for working through this one. I know it's um, been a, a difficult one, but I think we've worked together. So um, I appreciate all the conversations. Uh, so this moves us on to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at Smooth Hummocks, southern end of Westerwick Way. All right, this was a nice easy one. This was for a, uh, a seasonal installation of aluminum beach stairs. So uh, 
I didn't really have any conditions. So it seemed pretty straightforward that they're going to put him in in the late spring and he's been through the summer and all back out. So. Well, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Was drafted. All right, so I'll give the motion to Ian. Seth, were you going for the second? No, I have a quick comment, if, if yeah. I may. Yeah. I was um, by... <laughs> Lip it in. This, this is directed to Jeff. Um, more of just a question of when these seasonal stairs uh, come in and out, are you notified of those install dates? Um, yes. So they, okay. they have to still file their regular, all of our orders require start work forms for when things are going on. So they have to notice us when they're, they're doing that work. And I think this was even more specific that they're removing the stairs completely off the property to be stored at Land Bank. Yeah, they store all of their stair sets out at their shop out, out by the Biocomic Golf Course. So they don't like the chance weird erosion happening and losing, you know, a couple thousand dollars set of stairs. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, move to approve. Okay, uh, so motion made by Ian. Is there a second? Seconded by Mark. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Popham? Aye. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Waterfront Pacamo LLC at 17 Loretta Lane. Any thoughts or comments from commissioners? Oh, Jeff, you're muted. You can go ahead. I don't need to talk about it. <laughs> um, any questions or comments from commissioners or does somebody want Jeff to talk about it? Sure. Um, sure, I, I guess I will. So this was the, again, the, the the brick to granite patios and then some some landscaping improvements. Uh, I didn't really have any conditions for it. So it seemed like it was pretty straightforward going from brick to granite, and converting a portion of, of some scrub vegetation to, to lawn area. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Move to issue. All right, is there a second? Seconded by Seth. Move by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Popham? Aye. That carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Randolph G. Sharp Jr. Trust at 49A Meadowview Drive. <laughs> Uh, Seth, and then Mark, I'll go to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think we need to call out that a waiver is actually required here for the two foot separation for the uh, to groundwater, to high groundwater for the footing of the crawl space, but not for the bottom of the pool. Yes, thank you, Seth. I'm writing as quickly as I can, but um, which one was the going to be in the um, groundwater one that we were concerned with, 49 or 49A? 49 has the pool that's within the two foot separation, and they're going to come back. They continued that one. Um, 49A, which we're looking at right now the pool was out of the two foot separation to groundwater. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other thoughts on this one? It's like, no. Um, so is there a motion to approve as amended? Oh, wait, 
Well, one second. I, I just want to, this is a little out of the ordinary. Um, I wrote it and, and I may uh, make some quick edits because I, I can see a couple of red lines from typing too fast. Uh, we're just going to put under the waivers that waivers are required to section 3.02 B1 that all structures are to maintain a two foot separation to groundwater. And then the part I was going to add after that was based upon provided soil evaluations, it was demonstrated that groundwater conditions, sorry, I need to edit. Based upon provided soil evaluations, it was demonstrated that the two foot separation was the waiver was only needed for the structure, for the house structure and not the pool structure. Good addition. And then I was gonna say, given that information, the commission grants a waiver for the footings of the house based upon, not based upon, provides for the footings of the house um, as allowed by section 1.03 F3A of the Nantucket Wetland Protection Regulations. Is that's the no adverse impacts, no reasonable alternatives? Correct. Thoughts on that? Thank you, Jeff, for writing that on the fly for us. Like I said, I may have to tweak some grammar because going through it and just having chopped through it a couple of times, I'm sure I missed some commas or did something. So that's the gist. Um, so at this point, is there a motion to approve as amended? Sure, as amended with possible grammatical tweaks. Yes. Uh, is there a second? Uh, seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Popham? Aye. Great, that carries unanimously. And that, I believe, is the last one that we closed tonight. Yes. So that moves us on to approval of minutes uh, from May 6th and May 17th. Uh, did anybody see anything in the minutes they'd like to amend? Uh, Seth? For the May 17th uh, meeting related to the SBPF review, there's some discussion of me talking about a September 31st deadline uh, for mitigation material to be met. I said December with a D, 31st. Thank you, Seth, for clarifying that. Looks like Thank Terry. you, Terry. <laughs> um, anything else? All right, if not, I guess, is there a motion to approve May 6th without amendments and May 17th with amendments? Uh, Seth, motion made by so Seth. Moved. Uh, it looks like seconded by Dave. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Popham? Aye. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Thank you so you, much, Terry. Terry. That moves on to reports. Uh, we have crack. Uh, I missed the last meeting, so I, I have nothing to report. Okay. Uh, CPC? Uh, we uh, gave money out to five uh, nonprofits, and that was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have NP and EDC here. Uh, so that moves us on to enforcement. Oh, Jeff. Sorry, real quickly, before we leave committee uh, reports, I was just going to remind everybody that as we're going to see at least one seat turn over here soon, we're going to have to designate a new CPC representative. So if people are interested, not to put more on to Joe's plate, but I'm sure that he would be happy to talk with anybody um, for five minutes about what's entailed and probably the time commitment to go through that. But um, one of the seven of you 
is going to have to 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 fill the the large shoes left behind by by Joe in that case. And it's also possible if, if other people want to shift committees or are interested elsewhere that that may be possible because we could turn over a little bit, but we will have to replace Joe on CPC. So I would love the CPC appointment if no one else wants to talk about it. All right. Well, looks like we have one interested can party. We, can we vote on that right now? <laughs> That's a, no, we unfortunately oh, need to, no. to wait. No, no. Oh. Joe's, uh, Joe's still here. I don't want to step in those shoes. I was going to say, good Lord. <laughs> Push me over the bluff, guys. I just wanted to make sure yet, somebody was tagged along to you before you left. You turn oh. around for a minute, Joe, and you're forgotten. <laughs> you jump my grave that fast? <laughs> Joe, well, I was just trying to make sure someone was thinking about it and wanted to I, do it. So. Thank you. I knew what you meant. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, <laughs> It's I would be more than happy to keep it. I'm out of here. Thanks. <laughs> no, we still want you for, for a few more weeks here. <laughs> um, all right. Well, it sounds like we have some interests and now people have time to think about it. So that's, that's good. Um, so Jeff, we'll hand it over to you for enforcement updates with SBPF. Yes. So I, I know we had scheduled tonight when we last left our, our discussion from our special meeting for the annual report. Uh, we were talking about a date for following up and I, I think we all kind of understood the importance and, and the path that was going on of being able to have uh, both Greg Berman available for the commission to ask questions to and then also uh, pretty clearly to have uh, counsel there and to have George with us uh, to answer any questions, especially as we kind of proceed down the, the action path for uh, whatever is going to happen to, to bring that site into compliance one way or the other. So uh, we've reached out to both of them and I, I know we were trying to tackle it really soon, uh, but Joanne managed to, to kind of herd the cats and it looks like the first date that we can have both Greg and George and still get the, the technological infrastructure together to have that meeting is going to be on, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's June the 21st, correct? At 5 p.m.? So, yeah, it, it's at, I believe it's at 5 p.m. that day is the first day that we get everyone available. I apologize for not being sooner, uh, but that's kind of where we are. And we're also in a little bit of a wrinkle with uh, that may be an in-person meeting. We maybe have shifted that and that's thrown kind of an extra wrinkle into scheduling as well. Because uh, we're also waiting to see, we're hopefully, I think, George, even if we are in person, may still be attending remotely uh, for that meeting too, uh, but he is available for that time. So I know we wanted to tackle it sooner, but uh, we tried for an earlier date, like the week before, and uh, one of the two of them wasn't available, and I think we thought it was important enough to have them both there. So uh, hopefully that works for everybody else. Yes. And Jeff, is this a meeting because I know there is other legislation from the state, we might be able to do it remotely if that allows for everybody to participate more easily? I hope so. I mean, I there's a lot of questions about the legislation that was put forward by the governor for what that's going to look like and how people are going to be able to participate going forward. I know there are a lot of us that, that have communicated around that we would love to see some level of, even if it's Zoom, still be able to continue because we really feel like participation in a lot of meetings has been higher than normal because of the, the ability for people to, to be at home or to hop in on their phone and not have to like travel in and, and, and get there. And I know it's been super handy for, for folks like George who are you know representing multiple towns in multiple spots to be able to commit to shorter time windows because they're not having to travel to places. So uh, we're hopeful, but we also don't know if that legislation is going to get approved or not and what the final what the final draft of that's going to look like. So I think that's why we're all a little up in the air. And that's why we're still all booking, booking rooms and spaces like we're going to still be on this platform. Uh, and then booking the room, booking a physical room at the same time uh, in case we're not. So that's we're kind of double dipping to make sure that we're covered. I know that's kind of weird to say, but 
you would have thought by now in like the, you know, the 18 months of the pandemic going on, we would have had a better plan for how we are going to exit from the pandemic, but for to get back to meetings, but this is kind of where we're at. So we're just trying to adapt. Thank you for that explanation. And I know it a lot of work for you and Joanne to get this scheduled. I, I just get anxiety at the approach of uh, turnover of commissioners and making sure we get this um, issue yeah. well, us dealt with. Yeah, and, and I know I know we 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 talked about it in, in kind of a regular chair chats here, but you know it was something that we really pressed Greg and George to make sure that we could get this addressed before there was turnover on the board, at least to a some point of conclusion or some point where it was there. Uh, it's not the same as a public hearing where there's the same kind of uh, requirements for read-ins and things. Uh, it behaves a little bit differently, but I I don't know. I I would love to before there's any turnover, uh, get it to at least a point where there's at least a, a, a path of action that the board that's been sitting on it for the last, you know, two to three years has kind of put in place to then go forward with and at least see where it's gonna go regardless of what, what that action is. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any uh, questions for Jeff about this one? Like, no. Uh, so hopefully everybody will be available on June 21st. Looks like that's a Monday. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. So um, just to, to let everyone know, and I promise I'll stop talking because it's getting late, is uh, Erica Mooney sent out the list of, of boards and because uh, obviously with the rules for the pandemic changing uh, in two days and then again, obviously on the 15th uh, and potentially having to go back to live in-person meetings, there are... Uh, 40 boards and committees within the town that are all going to be competing for meeting space and time. Um, and then with that 40, there are 10 that are considered to be regulatory boards that take priority. And this is one of those boards. So that, that that's a plus, but uh, Joanne has been doing the legwork on this and I can only imagine, you know, seeing what the effort she puts in to get these put together, what Erica is trying to go through to, heard the cats for 10 regulatory boards plus another 30 boards that want to get back to some sort of regular meeting and time and space to make that happen and still have uh, some level of COVID consideration in there too. So um, it's a little crazy for meetings right at the moment. Um, well, we appreciate all your efforts. Um, so this moves us on to commissioner's comments. Do we have any commissioner's comments? I know not to add anything more to uh, your plates, but it would be great to just get some updates on some of the kind of outstanding enforcements that we had out there. I know Hollywood Farms out there. We have like 117 Baxter Road had an outgoing or an ongoing enforcement. The town at Sacaja Pond was kind of open out there. Um, just kind of see what's what's happening with some of those sites. So why don't, we'll, we'll put together, I know we have kind of a, a, a big spreadsheet we keep of all kind of enforcements that we've had. So why don't, we'll, we'll put that together and get the active ones snipped out for you guys. And we'll send that to you uh, as part of your regular packet for the next meeting. And we'll go through, go through all of them. Thank you. No problem. That moves us on to administrator staff reports. Um, I think we just covered most of the stuff that, that we were there. Just one reminder to folks, uh, annual town meeting is coming up on the Saturday, June the 5th. Um, yes, Saturday, June the 5th. Um, it's outside at the, the high school, uh, but just wanted to put a plug in that, that uh, if people would like to attend that that's the date and time and hopefully we'll see you there. I know I uh, will be there whether I want to be or not. So that's, should be a good time. Yeah, we don't hope sit next to each other, right? What's that? And don't sit next to each other. No. So, well, I, I didn't mean that in the COVID sense, but just yes. Yeah. We're, for yes, yeah. yes. We're so. not there as a quorum. We're there as separate people. Yes. No holding no. hands. I have an assigned seat that I apparently have to go to, so I don't really get a choice. Very lucky. So lucky. 
I've also been told I'm not allowed to sit next to Roberto anymore. It's for trouble. So. You guys are batting too much. Usually. So. <laughs> we got Libby to like spit water out of her mouth last town meeting. So. You guys stop heckling out. everybody. Yeah, we're not allowed to sit next to each other anymore. So. Well, you it can can't be fun. Why go? You know. You can just Snapchat each other from your separate seats, and that's probably worse. <laughs> so. But that's it. That's all I had. It's eight o'clock. So let's, right. let's I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Give it to Dave. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Fleur. Aye. And good night, everyone. Topham. They don't have to put a post. Aye. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Good night.